I come from what is known as the white Russian immigration. In other words, those Russians who left Russia just before the revolution, during the revolution, or just after. My family lived in Yugoslavia for 25 years. My mother was four years old when the family left Russia. She was the youngest of three children. Grew up in Yugoslavia, went to Belgrade University, met my father there who arrived in Belgrade by a totally different route from Siberia via the Far East to Yugoslavia. And uh, I was born in Yugoslavia, but I was a year old. I make no secret of the fact that I was born in 1943, so I'm an old lady of no. 70 at the moment. Um, I was four years old uh, when I have my first recollections of church. Uh, like all the so-called old emigres, we were members of the Russian Orthodox Church in exile or the church abroad, as it's been variously called. And the first church was in a refugee camp in post-war Germany. We were in the American zone. Um, there were old prisoner of war camps that had been converted into refugee camps. The first one was near Kassel in Germany, uh, a place called Mönchhof. Uh, these are the first recollections. And I remember the old barracks in which every family had a room. We were next door to the barracks that had been converted into a church because everywhere where there are Russians, you will find that a church will spring up very, very quickly. Uh, we moved from there to another refugee camp near, Mun in, near Munich, Schleisheim, and uh, I have more memories of the church there because I was older. And uh, my family was very much involved in church affairs. My grandfather on my mother's side was a member of the diocesan uh, council. So from an early age, you could say that I had very close and warm ties with the clergy of my church. And that includes our bishops and archbishops as they were at various times. Um, I think the thing that sets the Russian Orthodox Church in exile, I'm sorry, I'll go on calling it that because no. that's what it used to be, um, the closeness between the clergy and the laity. Our bishops were really, you could say, in the same boat as we were. We were all poor. We had no nothing, uh, nothing at all. Uh, we had to share and uh, we just had to make do as, as best we could. Um, we could approach our priests and bishops at any time. They knew us all by name. Um, there wasn't this gulf, which unfortunately I found to exist when I was posted to work in Russia. Um, and that was very strange to me because there were no priests with the exception of one or two in Moscow uh, to whom I could speak, well, for lack of a better expression, uh, as normal people speak to one another. Um, that doesn't mean disrespect because my grandmother taught me the fundamentals of the Orthodox faith. She taught me to pray. She taught me to respect the cloth which I do. But uh, th this total division, which I think exists even now, uh, I left Russia almost a year ago, I retired from work, uh, I was posted there as I've remarked, um, somehow it, it was just wrong. I, I never felt at home in the churches there because uh, the minute you'd walk in, and I don't think this is a particularly Russian trait. Um, whether the church abroad was more tolerant, but you didn't have anyone leaping at you and immediately saying, why aren't you wearing a headscarf? And why are you standing here? And why have you crossed yourself there? And, uh, you know, you think, well, you know, maybe I should just go away and not get in the way of everybody who prays. Um, 
it was so different growing up in, in the church in exile. Uh, as I said, we were all in the same boat. We were all emigres, like all first batches of emigres. I think there was more of a tendency to stick closer together. Um, the, as in my case, the Australian community, it was really one where you went to school, where you went to work. You moved to Melbourne, right? Yes, to, to Melbourne Germany. in Australia. Mm -hmm. uh, so... Well, I don't know. For, maybe for my parents it was not much so. They were much more in with the community and their contacts with the Australians were, you know, their, their workmates. Um, in my case, it was a sort of, you know, benign schizophrenia where you have the Russian language at home, the Russian church, everything is Russian, and then you have your school days where everything is Australian. And... Um, Somehow those two worlds managed to coexist. But I would say, certainly for my generation of uh, Russian emigre children, uh, the church was a focal point. Uh, for the adults, of course, uh, it was probably more a matter of faith. I mean, we were kids, we were, we were taken to church, and that's all there was about it. But everything hinged around the church. It was the rallying point, the national rallying point where you had, apart from the church, um, any amateur dramatics, groups that had formed or choirs or balalaika or orchestras or whatever, or children's plays because we're all roped into doing that sort of thing. Led ladies' committees. Yeah, oh, ladies' committees, certainly. You know, nothing could happen without them. Um, various political groups, you know, one lot would be meeting at one end of the church hall and another one, maybe totally opposed to them, would be amiably meeting at the other end of the hall. Um, it was a, a life within a life, I think. And uh, without the church, it wouldn't have happened. The church gathered us in, as you might say, uh, which... I didn't sense uh, in Russia when I went to work there. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, I'm ashamed to admit it, but uh, when I was growing up, the church was always far away. Just about everyone lived a long way from the church. It seemed to be one of those things that, you know, that had to be, um, because you'd have to go by train, and you'd have to go by tram, and then you'd have to walk a little bit. Whereas when I was living uh, in Moscow, there were churches all around me. And I must admit that I went to church less frequently there than I did when it, it was a long hike to the church every Sunday. Um, it, was, it was so unwelcoming in Moscow. The minute you walked in, Someone would be bound to come up to you and more or less, uh, more or less ask you, what are you doing here? Um, no. No, it, it was just two different approaches. And, and, and you mentioned previously about three different, uh, three different groups uh, of uh, Russian emigres in Melbourne. So what were they? Well, that probably is quite funny when you look at it and, and terribly human because uh, that didn't just happen in Melbourne. Absolutely. It happened all over, oh, yes. all oh, over yes. in Sydney, in Brisbane, anywhere as well. Uh, there was the first group, you know, the old emigres, you know, the, the bloody bourgeois, as the communists call us, uh, who'd emigrated. That was the first emigration. Then there was another significantly larger wave of uh, people who had been Soviet citizens or, you know, walked from all over the USSR, variously, Ukrainians, Russians, you know, you name it. They were there. Um, Dur during, and, during war years? Yes, this was straight after the war. They had either been prisoners of war, you know, somehow by hook or by crook. They were in Europe and then they managed to avoid being repatriated to the Soviet Union, even though hundreds of thousands were forcibly repatriated and perished in the camps. But the, this is a historical fact. Right, right. Um, and, of course, there were differences. 
between these two groups because one lot, well, for example, my grandmother who spoke a very literary Russian and uh, had very set ideas on, uh, I mean, the family were obviously monarchists and, you know, deplored the assassination or the killing of the royal family. And then you had a generation that had already grown up under so under the Soviet system uh, with everything uh, that's involved in that. Uh, of course, uh, propaganda, okay, you know, everyone has their own propaganda. Uh, I mean, probably the old emigres had their own views too, which were inflexible and uh, certainly, you know, it's, it happens. But this lot, of course, here, uh, you get a clash not so much, I'd say, of ideologies, because these people had experienced uh, the Soviet Union on their own backs. So, you know, <laughs> that's why they did everything they could not to go back there. But they had still been brought up on, under the Soviet system. They'd gone to schools where they'd been taught, you know, about the bad old days. Well, I'm not saying that, you know, the good old days were awfully good. They were the bad old days in many respects. But, of course, there was uh, this tendentious teaching. Uh, and, of course, you know, one lot uh, thought that the Soviet emigrants, let's, you know, for, for convenience sake, called them that, were, you know, uncultured slobs and, you know, had no table manners and that sort of thing. Uh, whereas they, in their turn thought that all the, all the old emigres were, uh, you know, uh, snobs and uh, who just, uh, it's a pity that they weren't killed off as well, you know, who thought that they were God's own bandmaster, that type of thing. Um, however, they had to subsist side by side. Again, because the only rallying point was the church. So um, uh, it was... Uh, I don't know whether one can really translate this because a sort of a lot of the people who came from the Soviet were atheists. All the old emigres, at least nominally, were religious believers. And uh, they used to say, and I'll say this in both languages, Are you going to church or to be near the church? So there were those who just went there to socialize. And of course, you know, they never stepped into the church. But nonetheless, you know, after a while, some kind of, you know, modus vivendi emerged from all that. Plus, plus there were Chinese. Until, uh, until the so-called Chinese immigration started to appear in around about 1955, as I recall it. I mean, I was uh, only sort of in my pre-teens then. But um, they suddenly appeared. And nobody knew who they were. And they'd say, we're from Harbin. And everyone said, where's that? <laughs> and, and they say, it was the Paris of the Far East. And those who had lived in Paris and had immigrated to Australia said, oh, yes. So, of course, you know, it didn't make for cordial relations immediately. Um, they were all, well, not all, but mainly from Manjuria. And uh, it was a Russian community that had been there oh, since the mid-19th century. They built the Trans-Siberian Railway, and uh, a lot of them actually stayed on there. And Harbin was, in fact, a Russian city. Okay. In the full sense of the word, you had Russian churches. Ran and, by Russians. Oh, absolutely. And uh, there were trading companies and everything. Uh, in fact, it was a joke that the you know the the local Chinese had to speak broken Russian in order to be understood, uh, and then uh, they did suffer a reversal of fortunes in 1945, when the Soviet army came in. Uh, all the teachers from then on, my ex-husband, for example, he went to school in Harbin, and all his teachers were from the Soviet Union. Uh, but then, uh, and, and they were taught, obviously, in Russian was, was the language in the schools. Uh, and then when the so-called eternal friendship between Russia and, and China broke down, or Soviet Union and, and China, uh, some did actually go back to the Soviet Union, and there was quite a lot of pressure on people to go there. 
um, even uh, my ex-husband recalls that their teacher would say, why don't you all go back as a class and you can live in the same town and be in the same class. It doesn't matter what your parents say. It was that bad. But uh, And some did, in fact, go back. Of course, none of them were sent to where they wanted to go. They were left in Central Asia to sort of raise the virgin soil and, and died there. Uh, but others dispersed elsewhere, and quite a lot of them came to Australia. And, uh, well, of course, you know, the first disappointment was that nobody knew where the hell Harbin was, and, you know, that it was the Paris of the Far East. And then little cracks began to emerge in relations because everyone thought they were better than the other lot. So the first emigration and the Soviet emigration closed ranks against the Chinese immigration. Um, and there was a lot of backbiting. And uh, there was one, I don't know whether, I'm not proud of it, but uh, the, this is a, an incident. All of us were all, you know, from the old immigration, grandchildren, old immigration, the Soviet immigration. And Easter comes, uh, well, it's, it's cold in Melbourne whenever Easter occurs because it's, you know, the end of summer and already going into winter, so it's cold. And all the ladies from Harbin used to come in fur coats. And because at that stage it was just the one church in Melbourne and everybody at the, the Easter service with their lit candles and we kids used to sneak up behind these ladies in their fur coats and singe them. Children can be extremely nasty, you know, much nastier oh, yeah. than adults. Uh, but that too, you know, in time, it simmered down. People's lives worked out somehow. There wasn't this pressing need uh, to see everyone all the time. But the church still remained the focal point mm -hmm. because any community undertaking was always around the church. And... Uh, there, there was, it was very strange that there were some Russians, not many, who didn't want to have anything to do with it. The ones... Uh, from, from, from older immigration? From, from, uh, from, from anyone. All, from anyone. No, the older immigration, well, most, a lot of them had died by then anyway, you know. And uh, my grandmother uh, spoke fluent French and German, and uh, she hated English because she used to say they write Liverpool and pronounce it Manchester. Uh, so, you know, Babushka never took to the English language. And they were all old then, and a lot of them had died. Um, of course, the younger ones, my, my parents' generation, had already had time to get work, to assimilate to a certain degree, to living, you know, in, in the... Australian world, mm -hmm. so to speak, uh, but even for my generation, uh, mixed marriages with Australians were very rare. Uh, it was par for the course that uh, you married a Russian boy or a Russian girl. Kind of went without saying. Yes, yes, it, uh, it was just one of those things. And um, whenever there were mixed marriages, everyone felt terribly sorry for the parents of whether the bridegroom or the bride who ever happened to be Russian. You know, poor things, their kids are never going to speak Russian and are they going to be baptized Orthodox? You know, there are all these, you know, heart-rending problems coming up uh, in that respect. But um, it's not quite so strongly felt now but but it's a, a paradox that a lot of the mixed marriages where the Russian uh, partner would drift away from the Russian community for a while uh, when the kids came along they they'd come even if they themselves didn't speak very good Russian they'd have their kids baptized in the church and send them to the Saturday Russian school and so on um, and uh, to do them credit, uh, the Australian partners never really had anything uh, against this. 
you know, they either remained neutral or they found themselves, you know, drawn whether they liked it or not. Or they would join. Into the Russian uh, roundabout. They, they at least formally would join the Orthodox Church. Uh, not cases. necessarily. Not necessarily. Not necessarily. A lot of them were married um, in the Russian Orthodox Church without uh, being baptized. Right, right, right. Uh, well, I don't know. May, this is my personal belief. I, I don't think you should baptize anyone against their will. No. You know, if, uh, if they're a believer and if they have been already baptized. I think uh, I may be wrong. Uh, that as far as, uh, say, Catholics are concerned, to the best of my knowledge, all you need to do is read the the Nicene Creed with, you know, the dreaded filioque said the way that we say it. Mm. And that is sufficient. It's it different with the Russian uh, church abroad. So uh, yeah. I'm there very yes. But I, I, see, I see what but, you mean. Um, I know that it's sufficiently widespread mm-hmm. now for it to be accepted. Mm. And for the children to to be a Christian Russian Orthodox without prejudice, so to speak, you know, no matter what the other parent may be, uh, but uh, it really is a paradox because you know the, these um, young people who had not been brought up in the Russian community or in the Russian mm-hmm. church suddenly discovering this need within themselves to uh, maybe learn some Russian. It's not a problem now because you get congregations where practically everyone speaks both languages. So, you know, Mm -hmm. the language barrier as such doesn't really exist. But that they want their children to become part of this community in which in many cases they they had no part of since they were children themselves. So it's, it's, it's a draw, you know, sort of, I don't know, call of the blood or or something like that. What, what do you see now, retrospectively, might be problems of the community, kind of? You mentioned about those things that enrich community and uh, very justly. But then what do you think might be kind of, uh, we speak about problems in Russia, that also Russia sort of doesn't want to confront uh, her historical past and so on. But what would be problems of Russian immigration, in your opinion? Uh, we, concerning themselves, you mean, or with uh, regard to the the Moscow? No, project? no, no. Concerning themselves, but concerning I mean, themselves. Moscow can be part of this as well. I, 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 I think. Uh, I think it's not really a problem. I think it's something that will settle out. Mm-hmm. When I was growing up, the services were invariably in in Slavonic. Mm-hmm. I mean, uh, and there was no need really right, for right, anything right. else. Um, I remember, actually, I, I was in Jordanville uh, giving a, a talk on the situation of believers in communist countries at the time we were celebrating the millennium of uh, the baptism of Russia and uh, talking to uh, the metropolitan there, Filaret. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, mentioning that uh, I felt that there is room in the church in Russia for some of the services to be conducted in the vernacular. Because after all, that's what, you know, Cyril and Methodius did for us way back then, you know, that the services were no longer conducted in Greek. Um, It wasn't a problem for me because my generation still could read uh, Church Slavonic. But... um, and in Russia, it is a problem. I've seen it. People say, I go to church, I can't understand a word they're saying. Well, it's exactly the same problem in uh, the church abroad, be it in Australia, be it in America, or, I don't know, Argentina, or wherever, because the children have been, even if they speak reasonable Russian at home, it's not the language of the church. And I think the problem facing both churches now is um, is it more important to understand what is being said during the service or to just stand there and let it roll around you um, I, I don't have a view on that simply because I have no problem with, with the Slavonic service so 
but I know a lot of people do. And uh, I mentioned this to Metropolitan Philaret, that there were, in fact, several priests in Russia who had had terrible trouble because they had served in, in the everyday was, was it Vitaly or Filaret? Uh, in 1988, right? Was 88. Then uh, Vitaly, yeah. Vitaly. Right, right. Vitaly. right. Yeah, yeah. And uh, he said, no, absolutely not. And I said, well, you know, Vladika, why not? And he said, well, people come over here from Russia and they have told me that by no means should uh, this order be changed from Slavonic into a modern, ver let's say, a modernized version, let's say, that the person who's new to the church would be able to understand what's being read, what's being said. No, 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 absolutely and utterly impossible. Uh, then after, shortly after that, I was in Australia and talking to a lady in Sydney who was sort of, you know, the, the doyen of the ladies' committees and so on in Sydney. And I said to her, uh, there are so many young people now for whom uh, the Slavonic, it, it's a dead letter. Surely you can do what's done in London, and I think it's a fabulous idea. They have the service... On this side, they've got the Slavonic. On this side, they've got a translation into English. So those who don't know the Slavonic, they can still follow the service because uh, you're a priest, choir, and so on. It's all broken up. And she said, no, 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 no. They've all got to learn church Slavonic. And I said, well, they're not going to. They're going to just stop going to church and go to some other church where they can, if they feel moved to go to a church, whatever, they'll go to another church where they can understand. You know, you're, you're uh, alienating people for the wrong reasons. What does it matter? You know, God isn't Russian. God understands all languages. <laughs> Why can't we praise him in all languages? Mind you, I used to annoy some of my colleagues in another job I had where you know, they'd say something about God, and I'd say, well, of course God speaks all church Slavonic, you know, he's a <laughs> Russian. But uh, when you look at it, it's ridiculous. Um, mind you, I asked my son, uh, who was an altar boy uh, in London for Metropolitan Anthony of Suraj, and Alex was about, I suppose, 12 at that time and they used to have what they called English Sunday one Sunday every month would the service would be in English and in fact the congregation previously had a vote on it should all because at that time you know the Russians were a minority old emigres mainly it's only in the past 20 years that you had more and uh, they voted no they, they, I thought it was uh, terrific they said, no, we want, you know, three, three Sundays, do it in Slavonic. We've become accustomed to it. And once a month, do it in English. And I said to my son, well, who does speak Russian, uh, I said, well, you must find it a, a lot easier when the service is in, in English because then you can understand everything. And he said, no, no, no. He said, I prefer the Slavonic. I said, why? And he said, well, the English doesn't sound right. <laughs> So, you know, uh, obviously there are various views on this, but I think this is a problem. Uh, both, well, the churches abroad certainly have to look at because they are in a, a foreign, in inverted commas, environment. And are they just going to serve those Russians who uh, either, you know, like old church Slavonic without understanding or, you know, do understand it and like it better? Because it is going to, the Russianness, shall we say, it's invariably it's going to dissipate with every congregation. So now do we come up against the problem of what's more important, the faith or the language? No, that's a serious You You really serious can't question. confuse the two. Um, I've come to this after thinking about it for a long time. Because, I mean, if you'd ask me... 25 years earlier, I probably would have also said, you know, Slavonic, if I can understand it, why can't everyone else? 
But that's nonsense. Not everyone has to understand Slavonic just because I do. Right, right, right. And even so, my knowledge of it isn't perfect, so I can't even, you know, uh, make any claims. What can I demand, say, of my granddaughters? I want them to be orthodox. Right. Whether it's Russian, Greek, uh, Romanian, or whatever, surely the faith should override external factors like that. We all have different customs. Uh, for example, I could never um, somehow acclimatize to the wearing of headscarves because it's not a canon of the Orthodox Church. It's, um, it's a habit. Uh, it's a, not, not a habit. It's a custom. But even so, it goes back to Judeo-Christian tradition where a married woman covers her head to indicate that she's under the protection of her husband's house. Whereas, you know, when I came to Russia, I saw tiny little tots in their mother's arms with little headscarves. For heaven's sake. Uh, or one incident... I saw at the Trinity St. Sergius Lavra where there was a lady there with a little girl who was about 10, I think, and um, had her little plaits, and someone came rushing up to her, some officious old day, why isn't the little girl's head covered? And uh, I presume it was her grandmother or her mother with her. She said, but, you know, she's only 10. She is going to give the monks salacious thoughts. I thought, well, you know, for 10-year-olds going to give them salacious thoughts, maybe they shouldn't be at the monastery or <laughs> somewhere else. And this is something I could never accustom myself to. Interesting. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's these things where um, trivia is elevated to the rank of dogma mm -hmm. and the spirit is seen as, uh, as something subsidiary to that. Can, Alona, can you also tell us about your uh, second, uh, your return kind of to Germany in, in 1971? How did you find church life there? Well, it was pretty much actually as I remembered it, uh, because uh, I came to Munich to uh -huh. work for Radio Liberty. Right. And uh, there was, I don't even know whether you could call it a barracks, uh, it was in Schwabing, and in a garden. You had to go through the garden from the street, and there was nothing to indicate there was a church there. It was a very small, well, I say it looked like a barracks. I don't know how, how it, you know, was preserved there. <laughs> and it was, you know, made, decorated, and made uh, as a church was. And uh, it was all terribly familiar, you know, because you had these little paper icons and little handmade, you know, altar cloths and things like that. So really it was just like, you know, a trip back in the, in a time machine. Mm -hmm. uh, the crowd, uh, the fact that everyone knew everyone and our terrible, terrible Russian Orthodox habit of moving around the church whenever you feel like it or, you know, say hello to, to someone who's just come in. But... Um, no, somehow, you know, the spirit had been retained. As I said, it was, you know, the first church was a barracks and this one was, you know, a barracks, albeit a bit smaller. Uh, later on, uh, they did, uh, the little shed had to be given up and uh, it wasn't actually an Orthodox church. There was a big church uh, on Salvato Platz in Munich where they were allowed to use they rented. Uh, one one of the premises inside that big building. and uh, But I, I would say that was still, you know, it was pretty much the same. The, the, there was nothing different or something that I found strange or alien. <coughs> uh, but uh, then when I was posted to England, uh, I did go to the church uh, in exile. It was on Queen Anne's Gate. I think, um, near uh, the, the uh, newest Emperor, Gloucester uh, Road. Uh, yeah. Gloucester Road. Uh, uh -huh. Emperor's Gate yeah. or Queen yeah. Anne's Gate, something yeah. like that. 
but it wasn't there for an awfully long time. And uh, the congregation was not a big one. Uh, it was sort of more mixed than I was accustomed to because you did have some Russians but who'd lived in England an awfully long time and uh, whose Russian was not all that great. But, but the services were, as far as I can recall, by that time quite a few churches were, were doing this in Australia as well, the key points like the prayer before communion uh, and so on, they were read in both languages uh, to make sure that, you know, the, the key points uh, of the service were understood by everybody. Um, and then that church had to be given up because it was in its was prime real estate. And the building of the church in Chiswick, I, I think they'd not even at that stage bought the lot. Or they had the land, but, you know, the church had to be built from scratch. It's a eustic house. Really. Yeah. Mm. So, uh, you know, the, that was... But by that time, I was already doing uh, the... Um, I was sort of the presenter and uh, co-author of the Russian religious program of the BBC, mm -hmm. as well as doing some work for Radio Liberty. That's how you met a uh, Metropolitan And that's Anthony. how I met Metropolitan Anthony okay. of Soros, let, let, let's because he used to give the weekly talk. Anjana, thank you kindly from the bottom of my heart for, for this interview, and I really moved. I appreciate you having me. Thanks so much, and we will pause here, and we will continue. You're very welcome.